Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Unstoppable Podcast. I'm Diana Chen, your host, and I'm here today with my co-host, Matthew Gold, co-founder and CEO of Unstoppable Domains. Hey, Matt, how's it going? I'm doing just fine. Great. So in a previous episode, we tackled the coins versus tokens question, and we got a little over ambitious there trying to tackle both sides of it, only got through coins. So we wanted to do another episode uh, covering more in detail what tokens are. So um, if you haven't yet listened to that coins versus tokens episode, please go back and do that right now so that you have some con context for what we're talking about. But Matt, to start off, why don't you just give us a super quick 60 second recap of what tokens are and then we'll dive into more of the details. Uh, tokens are, uh, they can be any type of asset you can think of that are represented uh, on a blockchain. And uh, a good way to think about this is collectibles, which we've talked a lot about in the past, uh, but they're things that you maybe wouldn't initially think about as uh, having some sort of uh, digital representation. So good, a good example is art that you can represent as a token on the blockchain. And all that does is show who owns it. So it's almost like a certificate of like, I'm the owner of this. And another one would be something like baseball cards or basketball cards. Uh, we've talked about a few companies that are actually already doing this uh, with NBA Top Shots as an example for uh, a token that represents a, a player card for basketball. So collectibles is a good way to get your mind around uh, what what can people do uh, with, with these tokens. Um, and... I think that like there's some other types of tokens as well, uh, but really we're going to focus on the collectibles batch of tokens, at least for this discussion. Okay, cool. Um, so one of the biggest things that I've, I've been seeing on Twitter and reading articles about and everything is NFTs. And we had Devin Finzer on from OpenSea on a previous episode talking about NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Um, and so I want to dive deeper into that and talk about exactly what NFTs are. So maybe to start off, why don't you tell us what's the difference between a fungible token and a non-fungible token NFT? There are two broad classes of tokens, and one was the collectibles, which I mentioned just a minute ago. There's also a whole sub subset of uh, what are known as fungible tokens, and that just means um, they're like units of account. So what does that mean? Uh, like if you have one share of stock of Microsoft or 100 shares of stock of Microsoft, all of those uh, shares are exactly the same. It's uh, just the number of them that are different. So let's talk about these fungible tokens uh, first. So uh, you have like security tokens, like shares of Microsoft that I talked about. Uh, you could also have a debt instrument, like you owe some, some someone some money. So there could be a, a token that represents uh, that loan. Uh, you could have uh, you could have a transactional token, <laughs> and so maybe this is like a token on the blockchain for an API credit for like Amazon. Uh, using an Amazon uh, server or something like that. Uh, these might also be classified as utility tokens. Uh, maybe you have a token on a crypto network that gives you, you know, uh, the right to verify a piece of information. Uh, that would be something like Chainlink, for instance, or you could have a governance token, which is a, a way for you to vote. And the thing about these fungible tokens is they're all, you can stack them on top of each other. So you could have like, you could have, uh, one share of Microsoft, or you could have a hundred shares of, of Microsoft. You could have one credit for a storage network on, you know, Amazon, or a hundred credits for a storage network. And the storage network can be, you know, like IPFS or one of these decentralized storage networks as well. Uh, then you could have a governance token, and uh, you could have one of those, and so you would have one vote, or you could have a thousand of those, and you would have a thousand votes. So all of these tokens are in the uh, fungible uh, token basket. And uh, the difference between these fungible tokens and uh, non-fungible tokens is that you can, they're countable. So you can have a bunch of them. Um, a great example of something that is a non-fungible token is like a piece of real estate. So anyone who's bought a piece of real estate before will tell you my house is unique, right? And it's like the only house that's like my house. And that's what real estate agents tell you all the time, like location, location, location. There can only be one person at that one spot. Um, at one time. And, and that's what makes non-fungible tokens uh, a unique class from uh, fungible tokens. And in the non-fungible space, again, I think about collector's items like baseball cards or something. And then when you're thinking in the fungible item token space, uh, I would think something like stock certificates, if I was to shortcut it and give you an easy thing to uh, hang your head on. 
Got it. So if we're thinking in terms of finance, which we oftentimes do as we talk about cryptocurrency, a fungible token would be something like uh, if I give you if I give you a dollar and you give me four quarters back, that's the same thing. It doesn't really matter. You don't have to give me that same exact dollar that I gave you back to me. But if I if, in the case of non fungible tokens, if I give you a dollar, you have to give me that exact same dollar bill back or else it's not the same thing. I like your first example there. Like if I give you for a fungible token, if I give you a dollar and you give me four quarters back, like I'm fine because it's exactly the same thing. For a non-fungible token, if I give you a Mona Lisa and then you give me back a Michael Jordan card, uh, that's not the same, right? <laughs> and you're like, oh, they're both cards. I'm like, well, no, probably the Mona Lisa is the one that I want to have back if that's the one I gave it to you. Uh, yeah, so that, I think that's a good way of doing that comparison. Got it. So in terms of the purpose that fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens serve, can you talk about each of them and how they differ? It's really about uh, uniqueness of, of the items. Uh, and so when you have a situation where you really want the underlying token to be uh, 100% equal to each other, and currencies are obviously the most uh, obvious one, like like in your example, if I give you a dollar, you know, it's good if you can give me back four quarters uh, instead of give, having to give me back exactly that do dollar, because that would make it much more complicated for trading. Other places where fungible tokens make sense in this case are uh, for service credits, like for storage. Like if you want to have storage on the on a on a IPFS network, like a decentralized storage network, or you want to have storage on something maybe more traditional like Amazon, those API credits you want them to be easily uh, switched out. So if, you know if I spend if I have you know ten thousand Amazon credits and I spend five thousand five hundred fifty five, you know you can you can subtract out <laughs> and then. Um, I'll, I'll just have my balance remaining on there. Uh, so that's when you're going to want to have a fungible token is when you really care uh, about it to be easy to exchange. When do you want a non-fungible token? A non-fungible token uh, works really well if you have a collection of unique items. Uh, and then it can actually get much more complex uh, because you could have unique items that have some things in common. And again, baseball cards are a great way to think about this. You could have a rookie card for uh, uh, Michael Jordan, right, for instance. And there may be like 50 of those rookie cards total in existence, um, but they, but there's only 50 total and they are uniquely different uh, from a rookie card for like Bo Jackson. Uh, so, so uh, that's, so that, so collections are just, I like to think about them as uh, a much more complex uh, fungible tokens, right? So you could have a, you could have a collection of items and that's like the superset. And, and maybe there's a, a subset of those items that are uh, fungible, but it doesn't work the other way around. So the, the non-fungible token space is much, much broader in the things that you can classify. And if you think about your everyday life, you know, the house that you live in, it's not the same as your neighbor's house. Like no one else can have that exact piece of property. So that would be a non-fungible uh, token. And then your identity that you have, like for your driver's license, like it, that should be unique, hopefully. Uh, and that would be an example of something that you could represent as a uh, non-fungible token. And when what we're doing when we say token is we're just taking something that uh, we have in a non-digital format and then turning it into a digital format for tracking that thing. So when you, when you hear fungible token or non-fungible token, um, you can just think in your head, okay, the token part means that I've just made a digital representation of that thing uh, so that it's easier to track in our computerized world. And the first part of that, uh, whether it's fungible or not, is just a description of how complex the uh, amount of data is that's associated with that particular item. And again, like a Michael Jordan original rookie uh, card is much more unique and has a lot more information about it uh, than a, a single share of a company that's just like any other share of company. So can you talk about some some of the reasons why NFTs have gotten so much hype recently? It seems like everybody's talking about it, whether positive or negative. Is it just because it's a newer class than fungible tokens or because it's it has a broader applicability than fungible tokens? Or um, what else is important for people to know about NFTs right now? Well, I would say one thing that's different about NFTs is they traditionally sit in spaces that have uh, less uh, regulation, just to be uh, straightforward about it. So most of our fungible tokens, like the currency that we use or the stock certificates are highly regulated. Um, 
Whereas for the non-fungible token space, the collector, the collector's items, uh, there's a lot less uh, rules around engagement. And this is because it, inside the, you know, the collections market, each one of those markets itself is kind of unique and small. Uh, and again, it's because a baseball card is different than a basketball card uh, is different from, you know, a pottery collection. So these things are very different from each other. And your house is different than your neighbor's house. Uh, and a house in California is different than a house in Texas. Um, you know, cause they don't have earthquakes. So there's, there's all these, so these markets are a lot uh, smaller and maybe easier to tackle uh, from a, from just a regulatory. And then also like a, a building process. Now, when I say easier to tackle, I mean, it's easier to see all the potential consequences of building a new ecosystem around a particular collectible. Like if you're selling basketball cards online, you, you know, um, you have a pretty good idea of your market and you don't have to worry about it potentially uh, causing problems for other people's markets. Very different if you create a, a cryptocurrency, like a USD uh, token on the blockchain, because now uh, for the US dollar tokens, for instance, there's $40 billion of those already. And the $40 billion is, you know, that's a lot of money. And that happened within two years. So that's really, really fast. And having $40 billion um, of digital currency out there that can make loans or uh, you know, start businesses uh, or trade can impact markets in a way that's much more uh, substantial. So um, I think that a lot of the reasons why NFTs are interesting right now is the markets are easier to understand um, and they're easier to tackle. Uh, and they're also they're good businesses like, and they're also a lot more of them. So you, you, there's, I think there's a lot of new, a lot more ways to innovate around NFTs, whereas finance is kind of a winner take all market uh, with a lot of regulation. Got it. So you, you mentioned earlier NBA top shots. That's one of the new ones of, you know, basically trading virtual basketball cards. And then there's also crypto kitties, for instance, we've talked about on a previous episode where you can see actual application of NFTs. Can you name some other examples, some big examples that are out there right now of how people can actually use NFTs? And then can you also imagine some other uses for NFTs that maybe haven't uh, become realized yet as of February 2021, but that we could see happening in the future. I'm not going to name drop just a bunch of projects, but I would suggest uh, going around and looking. And there's a lot of different places to look at all the different NFT projects that exist. There's a lot of um, artists that are directly creating these themselves. And as we learned in our conversation with Devin, you can actually create your own NFT right now uh, if you would like to uh, just try to get some engagement and, and figure out how these things how these things work. Um, if I'm thinking about what's something that NFTs could do that would be really impactful for everybody, uh, I actually kind of like uh, how this could potentially help with credentials. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a couple of them to think about, uh, like uh, tickets for a concert, right? Might be, might be interesting. Um, or uh, you could also think about something like licenses uh, for various different things that they could be really helpful to have those uh, digital. So gun license, for instance, if you're traveling between states, you know, the states have different laws, uh, it may be really nice if it's easier for uh, you to carry around um, some way to prove that you are properly licensed, you know, for hunting or what have you, as you, as you move around with different states, cause you have that in your trunk. Uh, and those databases are not perfect, uh, right now. So it'd be nice to have something like that on a blockchain. And then you'd want to track it uniquely, uh, something like that. Um, so that people could you know, make sure that, uh, you're being safe. So I think that things like that are potentially interesting. Um, and so, yeah, anything around licensing, I think is probably a good long-term thing to explore on NFTs. Credentials are also another one. I would say like college degrees, right? Like, so you always hear about these people pretending that they have a college degree that they don't really have. And that would be something that would be really easy educational attainment uh, to put as a, uh, some sort of token that's represented on the blockchain. And that would be unique to you. Cause it would, you know, have your name on it that says like, oh yeah, you do have an MBA or you did attend these four or five courses. And you can see this now with like Coursera and a few of these technical training courses online that people are posting their LinkedIn that are verified. So they're starting to do that, but it's not super, uh, portable between the different platforms. Um, so credentials, I think are credentials and licenses, I think are two areas that are longer term very interesting for NFTs. And then in the short term, I really like all the 
art and all, all the all the artwork and the different like little games that you're seeing that are popping up with NFTs. And again, those are like very safe areas for uh, companies, businesses, and people, in my opinion, to interact and play with uh, because you, you know what you're dealing with. You know, the downside is pretty limited. Uh, you can even make them yourself for free uh, and get just get a feel for how these types of things might work. Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering in the long run, do you see a situation where even smaller things like objects that you own can be represented by NFTs. Um, I, I'm just thinking about a situation where say your bike gets stolen, right? And then you go on Craigslist and you see somebody else selling your bike. So if you had an NFT attached to your bike, then somebody else couldn't sell that on Craigslist, right? Yeah, so I've actually thought about this too. And I actually, I think it would be neat if basically everything you bought, uh, like your receipts, you were able to like collate <laughs> into like one place. Now getting all that information on a blockchain right now is prohibitive just because blockchains aren't fast enough yet. Uh, and you know, we're at the dial up phase of blockchain. So we have like some time to get there, uh, but there's a lot of cool information you could have there. So one of the things that I have to do frequently is borrow something from one of my neighbors. <laughs> so I'm doing some sort of housework and I'm like, oh, I need an X tool. And so one of the thoughts that I just had was like, man, wouldn't it be cool if uh, my neighbors you know, they, everything that they're, all their household things that they're interacting with, if they had a catalog of that from their receipts, just as you're checking out or purchasing or whatever, uh, I could actually just ping my social network and be like, Hey, does anybody have, you know, this kind of wrench or maybe this saw, <laughs> or like I would, I could really use a riding lawnmower today or something like that. Um, and then I would be inside my own social network, be able to bubble up that information and they'd be like, Oh yeah, for sure. You can come and borrow it from me. Um, and there's all sorts of things that are happening like this already <laughs> for, uh, communities to uh, like, there's a lot of networks of like neighborhood associations or whatever people can share. And this would just kind of make that a lot easier uh, to do. So yeah, I think all your items should have something, you know, anything that you have that's over like 50 bucks, <laughs> like why not uh, have a place, have some sort of digital representation of it so that you can uh, run software against it. And the example I just gave you was uh, enabling your social network to search. <laughs> so, so, uh, and that's like, it seems it's not something that you would would be thinking about today that you would want to do, but I do think it's something that people in the future are going to be, oh yeah, of course I can easily uh, search through all the items that I own to find something. Is that something that you see realistically happening in the future beyond just being a crazy idea? I mean, it's, it's hard to say now, right? Because it's like, if we go back to dial up times, could you really envision something like Uber at that time? Probably not. Probably sounded way crazier than what you just said sounds to us today. I actually think it's not that crazy because they already track all the items in warehouses at like Amazon, right? And so they always say that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And if you go into like an Amazon warehouse or one of these big retailers, they have, you know, little NFT tags on all 10 million items in there and they can just run an, a huge scanner over the top of the roof and they, they know where everything is in the entire warehouse and they have like an inventory accounting. And for them, that's great because it just saves them a ton of money on tracking inventory. Now you don't think about it in your personal life, uh, but there's probably all sorts of things that you have more than one of, or that you've lost or something like that. And it would be nice if you could um, have a better sense of what that inventory was and what your usage was for, you know, personal life optimization. And I, and I, yeah, so I think it, I think it is, it's a natural thing that'll happen. And again, that's another area that's just search and you just see how big search is on you know, Google's a giant company for building search and people are getting more and more uh, personalized search tools, you know, AI assistants are a very good example of that on your cell phone where you can ask Siri for something and that's just a search instrument as well. So I think, yeah, I, I think that's more realistic than people may be imagining right now. Yeah, I gotcha. So for somebody that is new to the space, hearing about NFTs for the first time and this got them curious and they want to go check it out for themselves, what's the best way for them to go and buy an NFT? And then what can they actually do with it? Like, is it really just a digital token that they're hanging onto for who knows how long? Or say I go and buy an NFT that's attached to a piece of art that I really like, I can actually receive a physical painting um, with the NFT that I own to hang up on my wall and, you know, see something more tangible. I, we had a great conversation with uh, Devin uh, from OpenSea about this. And one of the things that I didn't know is they actually have a place for you to create your own NFTs right now, uh, just within their interface on OpenSea. So I think that's great. Like if you want to just play around, go and make your own. And then he was also suggesting a lot of artists 
uh, from musicians to, you know, actual um, like graffiti artists, right, for, for as another example, are going ahead and making their own NFTs, which have uh, real value for your typical everyday user right now who's not interested in creating. And I know there's a lot of creators out there, but for everyone who's just maybe kind of sitting on the sidelines and checking things out, um, it is still super early in this market and there is not a lot of utility for these uh, items yet. <laughs> We're talking about where would I display my piece of digital artwork? And right now you don't really have a lot of places to display it or to use it. Um, and then you're asking like, how can I buy something and then redeem it? Uh, we had a conversation around a company that had NFTs for wine and you could redeem it, but that was a little bit clunky. Like you could buy an NF you could buy a bottle of wine and then you could submit it to their website and then they would mail you the bottle of wine. Um, but that's, that is today, right? And if we fast forward you know, several years from now, you're going to have a lot more options for real world, world items that you could potentially redeem. And then you'll probably have a lot more places to uh, display or uh, interact using your NFT than you have uh, right now. So it's yeah, super early. I would suggest it's we're still in the play around phase. Uh, it's great if you're a creator because you can be you can jump right to the front of the line and get on there early. Uh, and then for others, I think it's uh, a great time to just go learn and kind of watch what's happening and follow your passion. Like if you're really passionate about this segment or this other segment, the cool part about NFTs is it covers a lot of ground. So uh, like you can, anything from real estate to art, to shoes, uh, to anything you can imagine that is a uh, group of items where they're you know kind of different from each other and uh, uh, maybe something that you would wanna put into a collection. Awesome, yeah, I, I definitely do think that with a lot of the things we talk about on this podcast, the best way to learn more is just to go and try it out yourself, play around with it, see what you can do with it, um, explore it more yourself, that's the best way to learn. Uh, next, kind of shifting gears a little bit here, one thing I wanna call out is uh, something that I've seen in the news a lot and something that we're all familiar with. Facebook has said, they've been saying since back in 2019 that they're going to launch a digital currency called DM. Um, on their Libra blockchain this year. So can you talk more about what that all means? Why is Facebook doing this? And what does that mean for actual users? Well, I think it would be great if we had uh, more companies experimenting with digital currencies. And uh, it's good to see a large company like Facebook pushing into this space after uh, our conversation uh, with with various people that we've talked with in this space, I actually think there's a lot more for them to work out on the regulatory side than you would imagine. So one of the big ones that got brought up recently for us, for me, that I had, hadn't thought deeply enough um, was in our recent conversation about privacy uh, with uh, that we had on the show. And if you create a Facebook uh, DM token, uh, and you're using the Facebook wallet and you're making all your payments with this, how much information is Facebook collecting about you, the user? So I will say that like six plus months ago, I was super excited about Facebook having a cryptocurrency because I was thinking to myself, wow, just think there's going to be like 2 billion more people who know how to interact with cryptocurrency. And so that's huge. It's huge market education. It's good for everybody to get more into crypto. On the flip side of that though, there are a lot of privacy concerns around using a Facebook cryptocurrency that I think should be explored much more deeply. So this is actually one area where I would like to see uh, more uh, government at least commenting on what on what this could mean for the industry. And I'm usually, you know, less regulation is usually better for new emerging industries. But this goes back to something I said earlier. When you're doing, when you're building a like currency token, which Facebook is essentially doing here, that's going to potentially interact with financial markets, it could get really big really fast. You could have you know five hundred billion dollars on Facebook currency inside of a year or two, uh, and that could impact financial markets, investing, um, fraud, <laughs> you know, you know, financing, all sorts of things, you just extremely rapidly. So, um, of all the places where I'm very excited about the crypto industry to just grow super fast. I would say in the case of the DM token for a big company like Facebook, I hope they take it a little bit slower. And, I, and it would be great if uh, regulators could sit down and talk to them about it because they're already gonna have issues in the EU over GDPR, um, what things are they allowed to track on users for their spending habits. I mean, what you spend your money on is 
very important and close to who you are. And if you if you could give me everyone's spending habits and everything they spend money on, I could tell you quite a lot about that person in a way that may be not great for democracy. And so we need to we definitely need to do a little bit more digging on the Facebook currency. Uh, so I'm going to be watching those announcements and I'm hoping to see uh, more regulators both here in the US and then in the EU and then also globally kind of dig in a little bit more and see how that's going to do. We have a lot of regulation around currency for banks for a reason. So I don't see why Facebook should escape uh, those regulations just because they claim to be you know, separate from that somehow. Yeah, and th this might be a different topic for a different day, but to me, my understanding is cryptocurrency, the whole point of that is privacy, autonomy, decentralization. And so having a big company that's very centralized, like Facebook, coming out with a cryptocurrency, it almost feels a little paradoxical. Like, help me wrap my mind around that. I think it is uh, definitely against the ethos for crypto people. Uh, and I also think it's against the ethos for just how our banking system works currently. There are all sorts of laws now around banks and what information they can share about your spending habits with other people. And that's for a reason. Like if you're if you're one of the large US banks, you can't resell your customers information about what they spend their money on. Uh, that's actually not allowed. And I think you have to get explicit customer permission and you have to do it pseudo anonymously. I actually don't know all the banking laws. So we'd love to talk to somebody <laughs> in the banking industry. Please submit yourself. We'd love to have you on the podcast to talk about that specifically with regards to uh, currency tokens like uh, the Facebook token that's coming out. So yeah, I, I think that it's not only against crypto ethos. It's not just uh, crypto people who are concerned about privacy invasion from Facebook coin. I also think it's just regular banking infrastructures. Exact, we already have these rules for our normal banking infrastructure. So why are we going to invent this new third way to do finance that has even less consumer protection? And I think that that's potentially, um, potentially dangerous if it's not handled correctly. Now, on the other hand, like I fully encourage large companies like Facebook to innovate in the blockchain space. I think it's super important. It's good to have them in the room. It's good to have them working to push things forward. Uh, they just please also follow the rules that we already have for regular banking. <laughs> I don't think you should accept yourself from the privacy laws uh, because this is a new technology field um, when you're potentially, because you could hurt people. Uh, and I think that they're, I think they're very aware of that. That's also why they slowed down the release. Like they originally wanted to come out uh, earlier than they are now. They also had a lot of design changes to how they're running that. So I think Facebook is going to be careful. And if they're not, I also fully expect U.S. regulators and EU regulators to start asking a lot more questions uh, because we should. For sure. All right, Matt, any final thoughts on where digital tokens, NFTs are going to be in 10 years before we wrap up? It's hard to predict because it's a super fast growing space. I do think it's interesting. This is one where I encourage people to go in uh, and go a little bit deeper. So, you know, in my social network, everyone's always reaching out to me to ask crypto questions. And this is one where I feel good directing people because it's safe. Just go play around with some uh, fun collectibles, uh, click around on these NFTs, uh, make your own, and then kind of get used to handling cryptocurrency with your own wallet, right? So like if you, you're not gonna be too upset if you uh, lose a drawing that you made, right, uh, for free. So it, I think it's like a, it's like a good way to enter into the crypto market uh, with with a low risk and then still get, you'll use all the technology that everyone's using for you know trading all these cryptocurrencies everywhere because uh, it's the same backend. So yeah, I think, I think it's a low risk way to get started uh, and I encourage everyone to go and play around. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Matt, on breaking down tokens for us. I hope you all learned a lot from this episode. Thank you for tuning in and we'll be back again soon with another episode of the Unstoppable Podcast.